Our next speaker, ladies and gentlemen, her husband was Dr. Lester Hoffman, with one F. I'll never forget that, H-O-F-M-A-N. And uh, when I was 12 years old, my sister took me to him, and uh, I was scared to death of the dentist, like all young people are. And uh, I got to know this guy, and I went to him the rest of my life until he passed away. And uh, I, I discovered that he had not only what Dr. Vigman would call great bedside manners, but he was a, he was a great conversationalist, personality, and he, and, he, and he was the most painless dentist that I ever went to. Well, I kept telling the host about this. I said, oh, but this guy, this guy's a painless dentist, man, and he's a great guy. And I said, okay, okay. So anyway, we're partying at Graceland one night, and we party until about four or five in the morning. Excuse me, and I come home, and I was living at home at that time, and I go to sleep about 5, 36 in the morning. About 7, 30, the phone rings. My mom answers, and she comes in, she says, George, he's got the phone, says he's Elvis, and he wants to talk to you. I said, Mom, we, we're up about five this morning. Elvis doesn't get up this early. There must be somebody playing a prank. So she goes to the phone, she comes back, and she says, George, this guy says he's Elvis, and you better come to the phone. <laughs> then I knew it was him. So I get to the phone, I said, what's up, he? He said, where's that painless dentist you've been telling me about? I said, well, Elvis, you know, he's out there in East Memphis, uh, not too far from where you sang on a flatbed truck at the Cat Shopping Center. Remember that? It was the Lamar Airway Shopping Center. It was a really nice area there. And he said, yeah. He said, well, I've got a, a problem with a tooth. He said, can you set it up where we can go by when he closes tonight? I said, sure. So I called, and make a long story shorter, uh, it was set up, and uh, he became Elvis' dentist until he passed away. And, uh, well, until Elvis passed away. And then Dr. Hoffman, before that, he, he was more than a dentist. It was unusual, Dr. Nick, that the people, even though he had a profession and, and a lifestyle, you became part of his family, you know, his entourage. Once he touched you, you were never the same. That was very true with, with Dr. Hoffman and Elvis and all. But she tells some lovely stories. Elvis would invite him out to his opening in Vegas, and he'd invite him to the New Year's Eve parties and to the birthday parties and everything. We, he, they became part of the, the Presley family. And uh, her husband, Lester, passed on not too long ago. And he, she has well, she's got some great stories about, I don't know if she's going to tell the story or not, but about Elvis putting his hand on her leg. <laughs> I hope she tells it's a cute story. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, here she is, Mrs. Sterling Hoffman. I want to thank George for the privilege of being here with your wonderful fans. And I bet some of you weren't even born when Elvis was alive. But I'll bet I got another bet on this. You know where you were when he died. I think that's the most famous, one of the most famous moments in our history. And I know I was out shopping, and when I got home, my phone rang one time after another, and people said, did you know Elvis died? I said, I don't believe it. He was with my husband last night. He was wonderful. They spent about three hours together. I just didn't believe it. And by about the ninth phone call, I thought, hey, everybody can't be wrong. So I immediately got in my car and drove to my husband's office and he was walking out with a patient that he had just finished and our eyes met and he looked at me and he went. And we both filled up with tears of course and I knew it was true. And that night he said, honey, a little bit of magic has gone out of our lives. Well, dear fans, it has not gone out of my life. You're still here. And the magic is still here. And I thank you. I thank you so much for being here. We all know stories about Elvis' generosity. That's gone around the world and everybody knows it. But the way he gave was so precious and sweet. And I'm going to go back to the day his mother died. And he secluded himself, I understand, in his room for several days. My husband and I made a call on him. I think his mother was buried on a Tuesday. And that Friday night, my husband and I paid a condolence call. And when we walked in the door, because you had an appointment, the gatekeeper knew you were coming. So you gave your name and you were allowed entrance. We went in the door and there were a crowd of young people in the living room and one of them turned to me and said, who are you here to see? 
I said, I'm going to make a control, it's called an elder. He said, he's not coming down. He hadn't been down since his mother was buried. And we all know what a wonderful, beautiful, loving relationship Elvis had with his mother. Well, anyway, Vernon, his father, walked in the room about five minutes later, and he said, Elvis will be right down. And that charming, precious young man walked in the room and sat down with us over in the corner, and he did his head like that, and everybody left the room, and I said, that's what it must feel like to be the king. <laughs> All he had to do was just that. <laughs> everybody got up and left, and with apologies to our newspaper, they were not always really kind to Elvis. They kind of were startled at his fame and kind of, I think, made a little funny things happen that didn't need to happen. And when he did this beautiful home for his mother, Gracelyn, and he said to me that night, he said, do you mind if I show you through my home and see what you think of it? Because the paper made it sound so garish, which they did. So we walked through every room and he said, I want to apologize. I don't want you to go in my mother's room yet. I can't go in there and I don't want to move anything, which of course was understandable because we know what this feeling was for his mother, which touched my heart because at the time I had a 14-year-old son and his job was to aggravate me. <laughs> this is and we know a team, that's their job, aggravate their mother and make her lose her temper so she can fly off the handle. Anyway, so I went through the home and he said, well, what do you think? And we ended up in his bedroom. And I said, let's swap keys. I'll move in any day, and I promise you I won't move an ashtray or a picture. But there was one thing up over the fireplace that kind of startled me because it was a kind of a modern sculpture. And my husband had the same thing in the waiting room in his office, and I thought, this home is much too elegant to have this piece of art. And believe it or not, the next I didn't say a word about it, but the next time we were at Graceland, that was gone. And there was a beautiful clock up over the mantel in the living room. And now I'll tell you a story about his generosity. Make sure to follow me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, at Globe Trotting with Trey for more Elvis content. My husband had a, always had an appointment with him at 10 o'clock at night. And he would tell the three young ladies who worked in his office, if the word gets around that Elvis is coming in, you don't have a job. <laughs> so naturally, they would have mobbed the office and he would not have been able to take care of Elvis. Although Elvis had wonderful teeth and took very good care of his teeth, he had them clean once in a while like everybody. And they were in the office around 10 o'clock that night. And he tried to give my husband a cuddle. I think George knows the story. He asked George, I think, have I given Dr. Hoffman a car? And George said, no, so he bought him a 1976 Cadillac Seville, one of the first ones off the line. And my husband was so startled. If you knew my husband, you would appreciate this story. He said, Elvis, I can't take a gift like that from you. He said, I have a car. Give it to somebody who doesn't have a car. That was my husband's nature. And I don't know whether this is true or not, but they said that Elvis said, call your wife Maybe she's smarter than you and will take the call. <laughs> True, okay. Well, anyway, they called me, and my husband had been ill prior to that, so when they called me to come to the office like at 11 o'clock at night, I was just frantic. I got there, I think, in seven minutes. And when I ran through the door, my husband's beaming face was coming out of his, coming into his reception room, and he was just smiling so big, and I thought, well, all is well, and two arms were put on my shoulders, and I was turned around, and it was Elvis. And he said, I heard you had a birthday this week. And he fished in his pocket, he said, I have a little gift for you. And he dangled those car keys in my face. Well, I said, what are you talking about? Anyway, he pushed me out the door, and they had pulled the car up under the front of the building where the light was shining on this beautiful silver car with a red top and red leather seats the 1976 Seville, he said, that's your birthday present. <laughs> well, I want to tell you, this just knocks the breath. I, I don't tremble easily, but I trembled for two weeks. It's, it's such an unbelievable shock that someone wants to do something so precious and wonderful to you. So I was standing up on the sidewalk, and he was down the steps, so we were eye to eye. And I said, why would you do a thing like this? Why would you give us a Cadillac? He said, it's a thank you present for your friendship. You've always treated me like a person and not a celebrity. And he said, I really do appreciate that. He said, you've never asked to take your picture with me, and we never did. Because he was a person, not a celebrity in my eyes. And that's the way I saw him. Just a heart of gold. 
and everything nice that you can possibly think of. And we miss him terribly, but I am so thrilled to see how many people are keeping his beautiful memory alive. And I thank you for allowing me to be here. Oh. Thank you. Tell us having your hands up, his hand on your leg. Come here, Miss Hoffman. She's 90, she's 90 plus years old. 92. Come here, Miss Hoffman. I want you to tell the story. I'll, I'll set it up and you run with it. You guys are out in Vegas. Elvis is performing. His, his mode of operation is after the show. He comes in, cleans up, dresses up, and he meets his guests. And don't forget to ask me, was he any good? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, tell the story about when you sat next to him. Okay. We were sitting on a love seat, and he was between my husband and me. I was on his left, my husband was on his right. And as they always did, all the managers brought their stars in and posed with Elvis Presley. So was, this is like well, 2 o'clock in the morning when they George by the end goes, you know, he was so hot and sweaty when he finished performing that he'd go take a shower first. And I have to preface this. When he walked out and saw us, I walked up, put my arms around him, and he said to me, was I any good? <laughs> Can you believe it? I said, man, you got a 20-minute standing ovation, didn't you hear it? <laughs> he said, no. Well, you're too high to hear it. I know it because I used to say in my youth. And you really don't. I would always say to my husband that I'll give any applause. So I can understand that. So anyway, we're in the dressing room and we're sitting between him on the love seat and all these celebrities started to walk in. And this must have been by 2 or 2 30 in the morning. And I said, I think we should leave Elvis because all these famous people are coming in to be with you. And he put his hand, he reached out with his left arm, he put his hand on my leg like this. And he said, stay there, that's them and this is us. <laughs> that sweetheart never thought himself as one of them. He was one of us which I think is so very touching. And I didn't know until after he died that that was a gesture that he used with his mother because she was very shy and didn't handle all this publicity as well as she could have or would have or should have. And he protected her by putting his hand on his knee from the time he was a little kid when people started towards her that he thought would upset her. And that was just a gesture that I had appreciated and have treasured all my life once I found out what it really meant. She's got five girls. Wow. She's a good storyteller, isn't she? Yeah. Sterling Hopkins, 92 years old. Thanks for watching this episode of Glow Trotting with Trey. Don't double dribble. Subscribe. It's free. Stay updated with every new video that I upload, which is once every Tuesday, and special ones here and there. Please like this video if you like it, share it, and until next time, I'll see you down the road. Thanks for watching.